Okay, Amy, when you're ready, we'll hit, oh, we're recording now. Okay. okay. Thank you everyone for joining us today for our final DD Awareness Month event. Um, we're very excited to be able to present some success stories today. So we have um, three different people telling us their success stories. Um, we have Lindsay O'Carey, who is joined by Erica Pellegrant. Um, we have Mary Catherine Sush, who's joined by her mother, Robin, and Randall Brown. And they're all gonna talk to us today about some of their successes and, and how they've gotten there. So we're gonna start with Lindsay. Um, Lindsay, can you tell us a little bit about how you came to live in Terrebonne Parish? Um, I used to live on the West Bank. Um, I was on the Genital Morbid crew from three to say 9.30. Um, I loved it, but it just got too much. So my, my family, my family and, and my mom and they were talking and decided to move to Homo. Um, and then we moved in, in July. Um, we stayed with my sister. Um, then I came to Homo, I came to Tart about 11 years ago. Um, and I love it. Um, it's the best place I can be. Great. And are you providing, are you receiving services from a, a provider agency? Yes, I am. Um, it's TARC. Okay. That's Terrebonne Arc, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and we also know that you, you also sit on the board for yes. Terrebonne Arc. What yes. is that like? Um, it's, I love that too. Um, I'm the voice of, for the clients. Um, I it practice my communication skills um, to give me more, be more communicative and explain myself. And so, so Lindsay, what does that look like when, um, like, how do you, how are you the voice for your, uh, for the individuals that we serve here? Um, I have a client rep meeting. We meet in the cafeteria. At two o'clock, we, we meet, um, and they they any ideas they have, they bring them to me, and then I write that in my report, and I bring that to the board. And then do you tell the board what happens in the meeting and their in you know yeah, what kind I, of ideas? Yeah, I, I have. I'll write the report, I tell the board, I read the report, and then I'll tell the board about what the ideas they brought to me. And we... Can you tell us about one of the, the biggest ideas that you just uh, brought to TARC with the individuals? Yes, um, I came up, well, one of the staff came up with, brought to my attention that we need to have a lunch program at Terrebonne Arc, um, and so I brought that up to the board. They located it. Um, we do blue tickets. We have yellow tickets, and then we have the blue tickets, and we put on the back of them. And the the clients are four dollars, and the staff are five dollars, so, so they get discounts. Yeah, she's so Lindsay was able to make a big change that helped a lot of people with individuals we serve and our staff. It, it, um, so now they're able to have discounted meals from the restaurant and um, it, it, it's been a huge hit. And it's yeah. because she brought something like that to the board and they've done their research and provided this great opportunity for our, the people we serve and our staff. That's great. Are there any other things that you can tell us about that you've kind of helped them, um, where you've helped Terrebonne Arc kind of change their services, where you've helped to guide them? Yes. Um, I'm, every month we have 
uh, new orientation. I go, I go in the, the off um, the conference room and tell what I do um, to the to the new staff, to the new employees, and that gives my that gives me more communication that you know that helps me to communicate to the other staff and so I like I like that too. So what are the things that you do during the new employee orientation? Um I share what I do. That I love my job. I've been there for 11 years. Um, and do they ask you questions? Sometimes they do ask me questions. And um, do, do you help them um, where they can understand uh, what they're about to, to do at TARC and how to work with uh, you know, all our, our individuals that we serve? Do you help them go through, you know, Talk about your job and I like do that. talk about my job, but like Miss Marilyn is also in there. Yeah. She and, and do you share your story to the, the, the staff that are starting at TARC yes. during orientation? So you I, share I share kind of I, what you just shared with us too. Yep. Okay. So where do you work? At the Bayou Country Cafe, um Bayou Country Cafe. And what do you do there? Um, I do sugar containers. I fold napkins. I do beignet boxes. Um, I put ketchup That's on the you. table. Um, yeah. Silverware. Like a, so I and get I get I get the morning done before the lunch rush. So Lindsay is our extraordinary waitress. Uh, <laughs> so she waits <laughs> tables yep. mostly. Huh? I bring up. Do, do their drink orders, I'll do their food, bring them to the tables. Yes. Yep, and customer service too, huh? Mm -hmm. You got it. So you talk to the customers? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And how's that experience when you're you're working, you're talking with the, the people that are dining in? You know, what is that like? I love it because I like I said, I love my customers. I love it. Customers, my staff, I just love it. Like I just, I found my home. Yeah. So, what's the best part about your job? What do you like the most? Um. I found my home. Um. Aww. I've had jobs in the past where I people were so ugly to me mm -hmm. and I, I found where I needed to be and yeah I just because why that's why why you know it's where you need to be I got a great support system at work and I got support a great support system at home That's great. It makes all the difference, right? Yes. How do you think working has changed your life? Um, I got to be more social, make friends, meet my customers. Um, I mean, it's just... It's, I just, yeah. I really do. You can just <laughs> yeah, say well, what your heart's saying. I just love it. I mean, I just don't want to go anyplace else. That's great. Um, what would you say your biggest accomplishments are? I make money. Um, <laughs> As a purpose, um, I got the key to the city. I got to cut the Bayou Country Cafe ribbon. 
I was Mardi Gras queen hmm. and my name was on the plaque in the, in the cafe. You've managed a lot of accomplishments. I have. <laughs> That's great. So if you were going to tell somebody else about, um, about working and why it's important for you to work, what would you tell them? Um, I guess it's a worst Um, just go out there and keep looking and they're going to find their niche because that's what I had to do. I had to go out there and find what I had to do. Right. Sometimes the first job isn't the right job, right? Exactly. Right. Yeah. Sometimes you have to keep looking. Exactly. <laughs> I'm glad that you found one that you love. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Erica, if you wouldn't mind answering some questions for us too, we'll get you Absolutely. in there. Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what it is that you do? Yes, um, my name is Erica Pellegrin and I'm a director at Terrebonne Arc in Homa, Louisiana in Terrebonne Parish. I currently oversee our homegrown salsa and pepper jelly business, our Cajun Confessions bakery oh. business our community day program, as well as our community employment program um, and marketing events. So, you know, as a nonprofit, we have different hats. So, um, but yes. Um, so I work, work with uh, Lindsay on various projects with client representatives, helping her um, to really have a voice for our individuals that we serve and uh, trying to make those things happen at our agency. Great. Well. Um, we know that everybody has the ability to succeed. What are some of the, the biggest successes that you have seen while working at TARC? Um, some of the best successes, um, you know, I think it comes to really, uh, it's like how we see things and place people and our vision. But what we've learned is uh, the biggest thing, kind of like what Lindsay just said, it's finding people's niche. And sometimes it's not that easy, just like you and I, we've had to have different experiences and opportunities to figure out exactly what we want to do, where we fit in, things like that. So, and for some individuals that we serve, it might be difficult for them to communicate those kind of interests, or they might not have been exposed to different things. So what we try to do is to, to learn the individual and expose them to different experiences, whether it's a, the different businesses we have or in our community day program, or if they want to um, explore a community employment opportunity. But so once we you know, find their interests, then we kind of go from there. And that's when we find those success, that, that true success that, um, because we don't want to play someone for the short term. We, we think a success is like long-term happiness, you know, um, trying to find their talents and gifts that they can offer wherever that looks like. Um, so some of our successes, whether it's in a TARC owned business where, um, you know, they might not have known any kind of job skills such as mopping or working with customers or things like that. And we really kind of hone in on that if they have an interest yeah. in it. Just like you and I, we're more successful yeah. if we like what we're doing. So that's the key to successful employment or successful programming. Make sure they like it, you know. Um, and that's just my thing, you know, just like you and I. Um, so that's one of the big things we try to do. And that's where you're going to see the success. Um, we recently we had an individual, we learned that he had an interest in airplanes. Well, now he is uh, working alongside one of the, um, the vendors at the, the local airport, helping clean airplanes and getting the planes ready. So it's kind of thinking outside the box. 
that really helps uh, true community employment or employment in our group employment opportunities. And sometimes if they don't have the skills yet for those, we explore them other available opportunities in our day program, whether it's, you know, uh, the community outings where they can learn how to be around people and, and the customer service and, you know, just even learning soft skills such as sweeping or mopping or even dusting, you know, things like that that can help them um, in any kind of job or activity, anything like that. So, but, but true success is really finding their interests, talents, and gifts that they can uh, really, uh, you know, share with the world. Yeah, great. Um, if there was somebody who has a disability interested in taking <laughs> risks, such as going to work or getting their own apartment, for instance, what would you tell them? Um, that's a great question, by the way. Um, I love that because um, when I reflect back on our own life too, you know, we've had to take moderate risk um, to, to big leaps of faith in, to get where we are at this point in our life. Um, so what I've also learned with Tark and, you know, Lindsay and I are kind of talking about this. Um, it's easy to say, no, that's too risky for this individual. Oh, they might do this. Or what about this? We can do a lot of what ifs. But what I'm trying to learn and to grow from is listening to what that individual wants because it's their life. Um, and, how, but, and not trying to be a dream stopper but be a dream maker, you know, because I think we're, we're putting that person's life to help them to even explore it, you know, so I, you know, take the chance, explore it, um, you know, Lindsay mentioned earlier, she gained all these gifts just from experiencing working, you know, communicating, socializing, things like that, so many good, so much good can come out of taking measured and safe risk, you know, when they have a true support system. So I say go for it. Great. Thank you so much, Lindsay and Erica, for, for sharing with us. Um, I don't see any questions for you, but if something comes up, we will, uh, we'll get back to you and ask you some more questions. Sounds great. Thank y'all for having Thank us. Thank y'all. Thank, Thank y'all. Um, all right, Mary Catherine, it's your turn. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. So why don't you tell us a little bit about, um, after high school? Yeah. Where did you go? What did you do? Uh, I went to give it a high back here. And we went to, uh, Nickel after that. You went to Nichols. Yeah. Okay. Hey. Yeah. What was that program called? I'm sorry. Uh, Brandy Pringett. Great. And Nichols. Can you tell us a little bit about that program, about attending Nichols? Uh, after Nichols? No, what did you do at Nichols? Tell them what, what the program involved. Going to classes. Uh, B classes. I'm an OC church there. And work. I work uh, the, the rest of her, the burina. Mm -hmm. Going to shower, washing. Like parties and activities on crawfish day. Uh, kind of stuff in the outside as uh, the rest there. Yeah. And you were on a, a team at the rec center. It was awards day. Yeah. I went to awards day, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the British Independence Program um, is full inclusion uh, at Nichols State University. And so they followed a curriculum um, that uh, would benefit them in, you know, their future, like speech. Um, 
they did PE classes that um, promoted long-term health, you know, exercising and how to keep yourself healthy. Uh, Mary Catherine took art classes, which she loved. And all of these classes each semester were full inclusion with regular students at Nichols. And then half of the day, they went to the classes in the morning and half of the day was spent on a job. And Mary uh, was placed at the rec center and it was fabulous because it, there were so many student workers there and uh, they worked, the whole uh, rec center works as a team. And it was fabulous. So she was responsible for collecting all the towels that the um, people in the rec center yeah. used. Me and, me and Cooper worked there. Yeah, she and Cooper, her friend. And um, she did the laundry. Yeah. Uh, she operated. Morning. This huge industrial washing machines yeah. and uh, picked it up just like that. And so she did that and she loved it because it gave her a great opportunity to meet people and to be on a team and participate. Yeah. Huh? yeah. I think I said it in a nutshell. <laughs> um, so she did that. And uh, she lived on campus. Yeah. She had a roommate and she lived on campus for two years. Yeah. And uh, she would Bobby come. and Paige. Yeah. yeah. And she would come home on the weekends. And uh, she, she was responsible for getting to class every day. I think she was yeah. only late one time. Yeah. And then after Dr. Mary Burrow got a hold of her, she never was late again. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> um so yeah i mean she she went she went to you know cafeteria she had a, dinner yeah yeah and nichols is, was great university setting is so good because it is like a little city everything is there that you need so it's the perfect environment to learn all those independent skills and have a you know, an opportunity to um, be with your same age peers, you know, and have a college experience, go to football games, um, go to dances and mixers. And up and down dance when we do. Yeah. My mom and my dad. Yeah. So lots, it was such a great experience for me. And my dad. Yeah. And it's skills-based, you know, functional skills-based and um, it is certificate. So they have objectives, you know, of work skills and personal relationship skills and health skills. And so by the end of that two years, they have a certificate with a skills-based, you know, um, achieve, that were achieved so that you can go to an employer and say, yes, I, she's done this. She worked, you know, two years at the rec center. She, so it's, yeah. it was absolutely fabulous. And of course, the outcome after with um, Christine Russell, uh, the Lafouche DA yeah. wanting to hire one of the students from the bridge program. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. and she found a good match with Mary. And Mary will be at the DA's office working competitively. I work today with the morning. Yes. Yeah. She wasn't real happy about having to take off work <laughs> to come to the Zoom meeting, but Christine said it was okay. Okay with me. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, she's nearly, it's nearly four years now that she's think, been at the DA's. No, office. three years. Three years. Yeah. It'll be four in June. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And thank you for taking off work to join us today. We're very appreciative that you did that. <laughs> so what do you do at the DA's office? Airing, shredding, and stuff like that. Shredding and errands. Yeah. I did paper earlier in the morning. Delivered papers? Yeah, that morning. Yeah. So we're fortunate. Mary lives independently in her own apartment downtown. 
right next to me. So it's only probably about 500 feet away from the DA's office. Yeah. So as I said, Nichols was like a little city. Mary lives in the city of Thibodeau. And so she has access to the community and can walk because driving really is the only thing that she, you know, needs somebody to take her, but she can walk. So she walks to the DA's office. And then, so at the DA's office, she walks to sheriff's department or clerk of court or, you know, wherever she's asked to go. And she's very familiar with it. People all around here know Mary and um, she's gotten to know all the government workers and the attorneys. Yeah. So she, it's nice that we live here. It's just perfect. And she has access to community, write her job. So she's basically set up for life, you know, for later on. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, what skills did you learn when you were at Nichols that you use now in your job? Uh, right now, my job, uh, I don't know. Like responsibility, being somewhere on time, doing, you know. Doing my own thing I like to do. Yeah. Yeah. Getting the job done. Yep. Working hard every day. Yeah, working at home too. Yeah, okay. she works at home too. Uh, she does a lot of shredding, which yes. is such an important job for an environment like the DA's office, for yeah. sure. And so what is it that, some things that you learned at Nichols in the job that you did at Nichols that transferred here? working on a team, getting along, how to get along with people and yeah. what else? You think? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Doing what's expected of you? Uh, Help people or something like that. Mm -hmm. I'm an animal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, what do you like the most about your job? My job. Your paycheck. <laughs> uh, help people at work. She likes yeah. that paycheck. Yeah, paycheck every Friday. So I still cash the paycheck. Yeah, and money, money, honey. <laughs> yeah, that's important too. Yeah. Because that gives her independent money to go and so shopping. Shopping. In my downtown friend. Thibodeau. I work. My friend Dale from there too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they like to go shopping. Yeah. I get that. Birthday, anniversary. And eating out. Yeah, in and out. <laughs> Good. Um, what do you like about living in your own apartment? Uh, pretty great. <laughs> it's pretty great, she said. Yeah. 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 You can be independent. See, I talked to her this morning about, you know, the questions because expressive yeah. language is a difficulty for her. Um, and she, I asked her, you know, what she likes about living independent. And she says, um, that it makes her happy and that she's proud yeah. and that she can take care of herself yeah. and um, responsible for herself, um, which she is. She takes care of all of her own personal needs and that she can um, walk and go places and make her own decisions. Yeah. That's a biggie. And then came my baby girl right here. Yes. And they hop and leave. And Mary takes care of her cat beautifully. Mm -hmm. And she, uh, mm -hmm. she clean, she, 
keeps a very clean house, I must say. Yeah. Much tidier than mine. Mm -hmm. And let's see yeah. what else did she say. <laughs> yep. Just basically the independent stuff, making her own decisions and her choices. And, um, you know, having a life um, very, very similar to her four siblings that um, all yeah. graduated high school, graduated college, and yeah. are working and have jobs. I mean, she has been offered every opportunity and been able to take advantage of that. And I must say, you know, just the, our community in Thibodeau has always been so supportive of Mary from a young age. She had some significant health uh, uh, problems when she was born. I mean, it's just a miracle. And so she had life-saving surgery at birth and then she was diagnosed with leukemia, AML leukemia, which is a very rare leukemia. Um, and that went on, you know, that was horrific, but she survived that. And she received an excellent education in Lafouche Parish Schools and hats off to all her teachers. Yeah, they were absolutely fabulous and all inclusion. And you know, those first teachers are very important because what they model to the students in the inclusion room and how they, you know, interact with individuals with disabilities has such a huge impact on, you know, mm -hmm. on the inclusive child and makes a huge difference. So kudos to all great teachers that model, you know, how to interact with individuals with disabilities. Yeah talk about they're invaluable, extremely important. Yes. Um, Mary Catherine, how do you think attending Nichols helped you reach your goals? Uh, my goal. Remember you said you did everything on your own at Nichols? Uh, walking um uh, all having to be responsible is that what it uh, 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 uh my friend Katie her, my friend Katie and the nickel too. Yeah. Yeah. So you made some friends while you were there too. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? How did it help you? Uh, Just good supportive practice, you know, yeah. of skills. Um, just learning, you know, not having mama there to do, you know, ha knowing you have to do it and um, learning how to plan and schedule and what classes are here and keeping up with all that. Of course, Mary's good. That's the strength of her. She's very organized um, yeah. and she loves, you know, May. Uh, writing and notebook. <laughs> notebooks and keeping documentation yeah. and data. Yeah. She loves doing that. Um, she likes to gather data. Yeah. I've got Facebook and walk around. Mm -hmm. She documents everything mm -hmm. she does. Yeah. That's great. I wish I could be a little more organized like you. And an iPad too. And two of them now. Yeah. <laughs> She's very tech savvy. And uh and that really opened the door for Mary a long time ago. When she turned 13, you know, she got her first phone and it was a big decision, risky, you know. Um, and I, I have my new phone right now. But I tell you, <laughs> that opened the world to Mary. I got it. And Goodbye. it's been a real blessing 
because, and it's, it's the best motivator for learning to read is to be able to read <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. That, and communicate. I mean, it opened so many avenues for her in communicating, especially with her, Mary has great receptive language, what she understands very good, but expressive, which is very common in individuals with Down syndrome, expressive is difficult, the processing of what she wants to say, but she gets her point across on her phone and in her text, and it's been a great learning tool for her. Yeah. So Robin, if we could ask you, um, what was it like for you from the parent perspective of, um, of Mary Catherine, you know, going to Nichols and living on campus and, and then leaving Nichols and getting her own apartment and yeah. involved with that? Well, you know, we've always uh, treated Mary just like all of our other kids. I mean, we raised her base. I mean, you know, you have to make adjustments and accommodations. But, you know, we had high expectations of Mary and, you know, just like her brothers and her sisters, you know, her sister, I mean, she had every right to live a life that she wanted, you know, and she, as she grew, I mean, you know, and learned and, you know, all that. I mean, you really, it's difficult when you're raising a child with a disability because when you have a typical kid, you kind of know the progress, right? You kind of, okay, they're going to go to school and they're going to go to high school and they're going to go to college and then they're going to get a job, you know? And, but with a, a, a child with disability, it's kind of one day at a time. I mean, you can make goals and then you get there, you know, but there's, you know, it's a little bit more of um, a curvy road because you, you just don't know, you know? And I, uh, so we, we, every opportunity, I mean, for her to be in the community and do things, I mean, she played on all the baseball leagues. She won a city championship in her baseball team. Baseball, softball. Yeah, she, she played all those sports, all Pretty inclusive. Why? Yeah. yeah, and, um, but, you know, Mary, I think just like any in like voting, voting, and and voting. And she just, she's always been very confident, you know, in herself. And she, I guess she was just kind of born that way. She's been through so much, but she could she always knew what she wanted to do and 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 that. So it was just a progression. And then you know, after high school and she was like, you know, we had worked with all the agencies and stuff and they really hadn't found anything for Mary. And um, so the opportunity Dr. Bro and I had to develop the Bridge to Independence program at Nichols. I was director of disability services there at the time and it just all fell into place. It was just, you know, it's God's work, you know, the moon and stars all come together and we were able to do that. And, you know, uh, you know, I, I did it for everybody, but, you know, it was great for Mary too. And so many others to have an opportunity to, you know, live out their potential and um, it, it, whatever that is. And if you had told me, back when she was eight, nine years old, that she would be working at the DA's office? I mean, mm -hmm. I'm honestly, and I am open-minded, and I am positive and optimistic in pretty much everything I do. But when Christine Russell called and had offered her the position at the DA's office, I had a hard time getting my head around that. I mean, I just never, it just never entered my mind. You know, I thought, the rec center or something like that, but it's so perfect. And like um, the other lady said, it's, you know, her strength. She loves office work. She loves having a desk. And we were yeah. walked in there the first day and they said, this is where your desk will be, Mary. And this is the supply cabinet. She was like, 
I have won the lottery, huh? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's just, you just never know, but you just, you just follow, you know, the path that they, as they learn and you can identify those strengths. And that's what we did. And um, Well, thank you both so much for joining us today and telling your stories. And I'm really, really excited for you. And I'm so happy that you're, you have a job that you love and an apartment that you love and a cat you love too. Yeah, <laughs> she does. She's living the life, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Um, again, I don't see any questions. So we're gonna move on to Randall Brown and hear his story. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Randall Brown, as um, she just pointed out, and um, I'm glad to be here today. And I've very much enjoyed hearing um, each of your stories, um, Lindsay and Mary. And um, I, I'm just honored to be part of today's discussion. Thank you, Randall. It's such good um, company. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, why don't you tell us about your employment journey? How did you get started? Uh, well, um, I'm not a youngster. So in about, it was 1996, I finished high school and I'm from a very rural part of North Louisiana. And honestly, there just wasn't a lot of opportunity. I have cerebral palsy I was born with and it affects my motor skills most of all. And so there just wasn't a lot of opportunity to be just frankly honest at that time uh, for me in terms of employment. Uh, there were in, ed in terms of education. Um, and so I took advantage of that, but there wasn't much in terms of employment and I wanted to work. I always wanted to work. I was raised to, you know, um, know that that was my path and what I needed to do and um, those types of things. And so, I was looking for ways I could work and things I could do. Well, a friend of mine had moved to Georgia and after high school. And so in 1996, the Summer Olympics was going on um, in Atlanta. And so there were a lot of companies that needed help, workers. So as luck would have it, she says, well, why don't you come out and try your luck at finding a job in Atlanta? And I thought, well, you know, I've never been outside of Louisiana other than a few travels, but um, okay, why not? You know, so I went and I stayed with that friend and her family and I found a job in the newspaper <laughs> um, for a major plumbing company. Um, they were looking for a data entry clerk, basically. And what my first job was, and I'll continue to tell my age and, and what it was, was they were converting their computer systems from DOS to Windows 1995. <laughs> and so my job was to, to help them do that, to go in and um, I had tinkered with computers since I was probably seven or eight. And so I felt like I could do it. The owner of the company was a major company and the owner of the company uh, took a risk on me and said, yeah, you, I think you can, probably do what we need and so um yeah so I got that job and I helped do that for about two maybe three weeks it was less than a month and all of a sudden they had um I got most of that the computers converted and the inventory lists uh if you don't know plumbing companies keep massive amounts of inventory of parts from pipes to fittings and all kinds of things and so all those things had to be put into the new systems and all of that. So I was still working on that and they had a massive walkout of workers in their customer service department with one day, just out of the blue, it was on a Friday. Uh, and they had a bunch of people quit in the customer service department. And I had never done anything like that. But my, my desk I was working at was right near what we called the bullpen, which was the area where everybody worked in customer service. And so the customer service manager came over in a panic and said, 
can you spend the afternoon working the phones? I said, I've never done it. She was like, it's not hard. You can do it. I'll train you. And so she did. Her name was Joan. And Joan trained me with the phone etiquette of what to do on the fly. And so I literally in an afternoon started working customer service. I say that because that was my first foray into ever working with the public. And uh, I was nervous at the time. And so I was 18 and I thought, okay, I'm probably going to miss this one up. But it worked out well. And I worked there for another few months and an opportunity came up to come back home. And so I did. And, uh, but I spent that time, those were my first forays into real employment. And um, so I learned those skills really well, honed them, working customer service for that major plumbing firm. And then came back to Louisiana and um, had a job for a while working as a receptionist for a bank and uh, finished college and then um, I did a lot of volunteer work for a number of years in there too. Um, one of the things I got to do was in 2000, the U.S. State Department sent a bunch of people with disabilities uh, to Costa Rica because Costa Rica's um, legislature had passed their version of the American with Disabilities Act. Well, I applied for and got a position on the team that went down there to talk about our ADA and how it affects us and how it is to live as an American with, with these rules and protections. And I was old enough to remember when we didn't have those. And so, um, and blessed to be able to remember when we got them. And so, um, you know, I know, know that process. And so I was picked to be part of that team to go down and help promote their, um, version of our ADA in the summer of 2000 and spent about a month crisscrossing the country mostly by bus. If you don't know, Costa Rica is about the size of New Jersey. So we spent a good number of weeks crisscrossing the country just promoting awareness of their new law. That was an eye opener because I got to see how the people in other countries or in another country in Latin America uh, with disabilities are treated and how they live. And um, it's, it was an eye opener. It um, changed my perception really of, of what I was blessed to that point be able to do. And even now um, to see, uh, cause we would go, I, we'd go places there and people would literally say like, it was a group, it wasn't just developmental disabilities. It was cross disability. There were, there were a blind advocate, there was a hard of hearing advocate um, that was on that team. There were about 10 of us. And uh, if I remember right. And so we, we would go together to events. And I remember the main question I got, other than you say where, where you were from, and people would ask me, one, did I have a pit alligator? And two, uh, did I know Britney Spears? <laughs> uh, no to both. Um, but those were common questions I got when they found out I was Louisiana. And then um, they asked me, well, did your parents let you come here alone? And my response was real quick and real simple. I didn't ask them I was coming here. I told them. And so that, that um, you know, was just an opener for me to really see how because we went to small villages we went to the big cities it was really it was fun but it was also very humbling because you learn just how much we have access to in terms of programming and no it's not perfect and we all you know there's always work to be done but that was one thing and it's one of the reasons I resolved to get more involved in advocating and, and embracing my disability more when I got back here after that summer was because we are so fortunate as Americans to have what we do in terms of the systems and the, the support. Um, as I said, it always needs improvement. We all know that, but it was just a real eye opener for me. So that was a very key turning point in me realizing that, hey, it's not just about you. Yes, this is your upward mobile journey, but 
the volunteerism, the giving back, the being able to to help in ways that might not benefit you now, but might benefit someone coming up behind you, it is important. It's very important. Uh, you know, to be accepted, to be seen working, to be seen productive, it has massive help and implications that that just I don't think can really be duplicated. I think seeing people in a working environment, seeing them flourish, seeing them find that employment that that works for them, that feeds their soul, that gives them purpose and gives them money to be independent um, and be able to make decisions um, for themselves. I mean, you can't, there's nothing in the world that that is better than that. It's what every person deserves and needs. Yeah. And so it was just critical for me uh, after that juncture. So then I started volunteering at Shriners Hospital. I did a few paid projects for them, but I mostly volunteered and I was their volunteer of the year in 2000. And I, I was a, functioned as a teacher's assistant and what's called a child life assistant for their child life department for 10 years. And then after that, I went back to college and LRS helped me get, um, and that's Louisiana Rehabilitate, Rehabilitation Services, helped me get my paralegal certification. Um, and I did some paralegal type work for a while here locally. Didn't really like that as much as I thought I would. So <laughs> I stumbled into the job I have now, which sort of marries everything I started doing together I work in in their for their internet department so I do a lot of their IT work internally and their data work but I also do um, customer service work um, I manage the small team that handles all their internet requests um, and so that's something that I do every day is deal with the public in that same sphere as when I started with the plumbing company now it's more texting than talking on the phone, but it's, it's both. Uh, but it, as, as technology progresses, we're more tech savvy than ever, whether we like it or not. Um, and, and so that's, um, so that's what I do today. That's what I've been doing for the past six years and Ford, uh, as well as my bosses at my dealership were phenomenal in allowing me to be able to be, um, active as an advocate for the six years I've been there. Of course, everybody uh, here may know, I, I don't know if my pan, fellow panelists know, but those of you on the call are all too aware you were stuck with me for six years <laughs> on the council. Um, and so, and the part of that was because my employer was so great about, yeah, do that, do, do those things that are important for your community. And, uh, I can't thank them enough for that ability because it's a tough job, um, you know, just in terms of, of the work and the hours I put in, but they were always, as long as you can get your work done, you can do what you need to do. And so that for me was phenomenal to be able to ha have the best of both worlds, to be able to work full time, be productive in that range and still try and provide and help in advocacy everywhere I could for the last five, six years. That's great. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about why you think volunteering and serving on these, these various boards is important? Well, I think it's important for every person with a disability, regardless of what that disability may be. I think it's important for us, and indeed, I think incumbent upon us um, to make sure our voices and our perspectives are heard, because frankly, um, we're not heard enough. We're not heard enough in corporate America. We're not heard enough inside the government structure. We're just not, we're not a, we're not a majority segment of the population, therefore, it's pivotal for those of us that are um, <clears throat> have disabilities and those that, of us that have been fortunate to be able to find work and be productive. I think our voices matter more than ever. 
uh, if you ask me, and I know I'm biased because I'm part of that, but I think because of the advent of technology and the way things are opening up and then you have now, you have yeah. the, the, you know, things are changing daily in the job market to where skill sets are needed that were showcased here um, with my fellow panelists. I mean, you need people that are going to be on time, conscientious, um, care about their job, love people, do the things that need to be done, not just what you want to do um, for the company. You know, those things are things we as people with disabilities, we, we all know. We all, I think we all know and live every day uh, having to prove ourselves and, and uh, <clears throat> be on time and conscientious and, and keep up with our appointments and do those things. That's natural parts of who we are as people. I think, and it, it serves us greatly, serves our companies greatly that we work for, that that's ingrained in most of us already. Um, and, and so I think we bring a massive, I think we're an untapped asset for a lot of companies. And so when they see that, I think it's only gonna open more doors for those um, both with and behind us. And so I, I think our ability to get out there and be part of systems where uh, our perspectives just might not be heard very often, I think is pivotal for the future of where we go as a disability community. Um, I mean, obviously everybody here is here because we love someone or we are someone with a disability. And so I know I'm preaching to the choir on all of this, but, uh, and y'all are all phenomenal. And I'm so proud to be here and proud of each of you. But I think that it's important for anyone who may hear this to know we're not unique in the sense that if you apply yourself, if you get out there and be seen and get known and, be, and, and people learn who you are and what your skill sets are, you're going to find work. You're going to find your purpose. You're going to find what it is that drives you. And the easy, one of the easiest ways to do that and get connected in areas that can get you the work and the things you're passionate about, I firmly believe is finding organizations that need your help and, and you can volunteer and use those connections to springboard into employment if you haven't already or to find a better job, you know. So I think it's just a great avenue. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I mean, you bring up a good point. Networking is extremely important. Um, yes. That's how a lot of people um get new employment that's how a lot of people maintain yes employment. i yeah. think networking is key that's one of the things that even now even though i've been at my job six years i still network i mean you still build those connections and network every day and i think it's yeah. pivotal to those new opportunities that may come along to, you know uh, along our path because life is long if we're fortunate and um you know i i, I can't I stress enough how important I think it is our perspectives are known and that we ourselves are known by people and the contributions we're making um, to society and to enriching our own lives. I think uh, is, is, a, is no better tool to show someone, hey, if he did it, if Randall did it, I know I can do it, you know, so right. I, and, and I, I know they can too. So, you know, and so that's just important for me that, you know, people know this is these stories, our stories, although wonderful and unique in a way, I, I, I'd be happy for mine to be a lot less unique. Yeah. If by the time I retire, there are more people like us working in major companies like I do, I'd, I'd be very happy for that. And I think that's possible and in fact, likely. Yeah. Yeah, I do too. Thank you so much. Um, we're coming up on the end of our time. So I just wanted to really quick tell all of you, all of the panelists, thank you so much for sharing your stories with us today. It means so much for people to be able to hear about, you know, what success looks like for different people. It's, it's different in all of it for everybody's circumstance, but it's so important that we share those success stories too. And we talk about what's working and, and how people are making things work. And so thank you so much for being willing to share. Um, I also just wanted to thank 
all of the people who helped put these webinar events together. Um, Bambi Polizzola with the governor's office of disability affairs, Kelly Monroe with the ARC of Louisiana, Karen Scallon with special needs and parent support services of Louisiana, Sharon Hennessy with People First Louisiana, um, Julie Foster Hagen and Bernard Brown with the Office for Citizens with Developmental Disabilities and uh, the Louisiana Developmental Disabilities Council have played a small part too. Um, so thank you all very much for joining us for these three webinars. We've really enjoyed being able to put this event on in celebration of Developmental Disabilities Awareness Month. So thank you all very much and have a wonderful day and a great weekend. You too.